Hey everybody, welcome to Five Years Ahead. I'm Brandon Kruger. Today to kick off this series on OctaValve, we're gonna introduce what it is and what makes it so special. First, as a primer, we'll take a first principles approach and ask what does a thermal management system need to do? Then we'll look at a few examples of thermal management systems from traditional automakers, as well as Tesla's previous super bottle system that was introduced on the Model 3. Finally, we'll see a basic overview of how the OctaValve system works and the four main factors that set it apart. But first, let's reason from first principles and ask, what does the EV's thermal management system need to do? To start, we have a drive unit and electronics. This includes the motor, the inverter, the charger, and the DC to DC converter. To my knowledge, every EV cools these components with the same coolant loop, so I'll just refer to the collection of them as the drive unit going forward. These components are happy being cold but can't get too hot, so we'll have to provide cooling as needed. Second, we have the battery pack. For the longest life, lithium ion batteries are typically happiest between 10 and 30 Celsius. Although for best supercharging speeds, Tesla will attempt the raise to battery temperature to 30 to 50 Celsius, depending on the state of charge of the battery pack. This higher temperature accelerates the chemical process in the battery, enabling a higher charge rate while minimizing damage. Third, but most importantly, we have the cabin. We need to be able to heat or cool the passenger compartment quickly and reliably, as well as provide dehumidification and defogging. Fourth, we'll need to be able to dump excess heat outside and we may want to absorb heat from outside. Finally, we'll also need the ability to generate heat using battery power when all of our sources are cold and have no heat to provide. Before we take a look at how traditional automakers tackle these requirements, we'll need a primer on what the whole industry has been using to solve this heat generation requirement, the PTC heater. PTC heaters are electric heating elements similar to glowing wires in your toaster. These have been necessary even on vehicles with heat pumps due to the heat pumps reduced effectiveness at very low ambient temperatures. Here we have three examples. Top left is from a 2011 Nissan LEAF. It is mounted under the hood and heats up coolant. This coolant is then passed to the heater core where the heat is transferred to the cabin air. The Chevy Bolt has two heaters like this as we will see shortly. A disadvantage of this approach is that it takes almost as long as an ICE vehicle to warm up and provide heat, since all the coolant must be heated before the cabin air can be heated. The bottom left is from a 2013 and up Nissan LEAF. Instead of heating coolant, it heats the air directly, which provides heat a lot faster. The top right is from the Model 3 before it got the OctaValve system. It works the same as the LEAFs below, only we can see this is split into two sections to provide different temperatures for driver and passenger. First, let's look at the 2011 Nissan LEAF. To keep this vehicle from being even more unreasonably expensive than it already was, Nissan had to take all measures possible to simplify and reduce costs. The resulting system was very similar to a traditional ICE vehicle. For the heating and cooling of the cabin, they could and likely used all the same parts as another ICE vehicle in their lineup, with the exception of an electric AC compressor in place of a belt-driven compressor and the PTC heater in place of the engine. Separately, a typical radiator is used to cool the drive unit. For the battery pack, they really cut costs and did nothing at all. The best part is no part, right? Not having any control over how hot or cold the pack could get caused issues with batteries degrading fast. Personally, my leaf needed its battery replaced after five years in the harsh climate of Indiana, at which point it can manage only 24 miles on a charge in winter. While I can understand the reasoning that led Nissan to cutting this corner, I think it was ultimately a mistake that worked to diminish the reputation of EVs. Before someone has to correct me in the comments, Nissan did start putting a heating element in their battery packs in 2012, but it was a mere 300 watts, only turned on below 10 Celsius or 14 Fahrenheit, and only if the car was not plugged in. I'm not counting this for anything. In 2013, Nissan started replacing the traditional air conditioning system with the heat pump system on some models. All that would be needed to accomplish this is the addition of a reversing valve and changes to software. This enables the system to operate in reverse, warming the interior and cooling the outside air. When it's warm enough outside for the system to function, it uses a fraction of the energy of a PTC heater to bring the same amount of heat into the cabin. At this time, Nissan also switched to a direct-to-air PTC heater, which takes place of the heater core 
and eliminates all the associated plumbing, coolant, and the PTC heater under the hood. To my knowledge, current Leafs are still using this same system and still doing nothing with the battery pack. Unlike the Leaf, the Chevy Bolt actually meets all the requirements we outlined at the beginning of the video. We can see it uses the same methods for cabin heating and drive unit cooling as a 2011 Leaf. The Bolt's second PTC heater I mentioned earlier is used to heat coolant for the battery pack. The existing AC system is tapped into and a heat exchanger is used to cool the coolant to the battery pack. This system likely utilized components their suppliers already offered. This works to reduce costs but was likely more than offset by the increased number of parts required. Tesla's previous system, known as a super bottle, accomplishes everything the Bolt system did with less parts. The cooling of the cabin and battery pack is accomplished the same way, but that's where the similarities end. The dual zone direct to air PTC heater we saw earlier allows for separate driver and passenger temperatures and avoids the coolant loop under the hood that the Bolt and the 2011 Leaf had. Where the system starts to get interesting is how Tesla accomplishes heating of the battery pack. Instead of using a PTC heater as in the Bolt, Tesla uses waste heat from the drive unit. Since electric motors are very efficient, they typically wouldn't produce enough heat to significantly warm the battery in a reasonable amount of time. However, Tesla is able to deliberately operate the motor inefficiently in order to generate more waste heat. This allows the drive unit they already have to also serve the function of the PTC heater we saw in the Bolt. As you'll see through the rest of this series, the concept of deliberately running a motor inefficiently to generate waste heat sets the foundation for the octa valve system to build upon. When heating of the battery is not necessary, a valve sends the drive unit's waste heat to a radiator and outside instead of to the battery pack. The chiller can then use the car's AC to cool the battery as needed. The advantage of this system, other than the reduction in parts, is the ability to utilize the waste heat the drive unit will inevitably generate. We still need to use electricity from the battery to generate any and all heat we need in the vehicle, but this will slightly reduce that demand. This brings us to the first and most well-known advantage of OctaValve, having one integrated system for everything. Now all our components are tied together and we can take heat from any component that needs cooling and provide it to any component that needs heating. This will always be more efficient than generating heat with a PTC heater. This also unlocks some new capabilities we will explore later, but first let's take a quick simplified look at how it works. At the center of the system we have an air conditioner that pumps heat from the cold side to the hot side. We'll learn more about how air conditioning and heat pumps work in the next video of the series. For now, the only understanding you need is that heat gets pulled from here, it gets cold, the heat gets pushed to here, it gets hot. One interesting fact to note here is that unlike virtually all other heat pump systems, there is no reversing valve and the refrigerant always flows the same direction. The hot side is always the hot side and the cold side is always the cold side. They do not switch functions as in a typical heat pump system. Instead, we just utilize whichever side of the air conditioner is needed. While the system is a heat pump by all practical purposes, I'm not sure if it technically meets the definition of one. Anyway, both sides of this AC system are tied to the cabin to provide heating and cooling as needed, as well as to the octavalve. Now the octavalve itself can be thought of like a network router, but for coolant. It can essentially connect coolant to the battery pack, drive unit, or radiator to the hot or cold side of the AC as needed. This gives us pathways to send heat from anywhere to anywhere, almost. One interesting aspect to note is the way this system works, it would actually be for the first time beneficial to use cabin heating while on the track. This is simply due to the fact that we can now dump extra drive motor and battery heat into the cabin in addition to the radiator. The second main advantage of this system is the elimination of PTC heaters entirely. How did they accomplish this? In theory, we could generate heat in the drive unit as we did with the super bottle system and pump that heat into the cabin. The problem with this is the time it would take to heat up the coolant. We would not be able to provide heat to the cabin near as fast as customers would have come to expect from the previous system's direct to air PTC heater. Their solution instead is even more clever and has never been seen in the auto industry before. This is going to seem a bit counterintuitive at first, but stick with me. To generate heat when we can't pull any from our other potential sources, we're going to circulate air in the dashboard in a closed loop over both sides of the AC system. 
At first it may seem like this wouldn't accomplish anything since we're pulling out the heat we just put in the loop, but since the heat coming out includes the energy consumed by the compressor, we will always be putting more heat into this loop than we're taking out. This causes heat to build up inside the loop. Now this factor alone would not be sufficient to eliminate the PTC heater. To make up the shortfall and supply sufficient heat, Tesla applied the trick we learned about with the super bottle system. Since we have an electric motor driving the compressor and an electric motor driving the blower fan, we can operate both of these motors inefficiently to generate even more heat. Now that we have three contributors of heat to this loop, the compressor, the compressor motor, and the blower motor, combined these can produce nearly as much heat as the output of the previous PTC heater, which allowed its elimination. After a few minutes of these three components dumping their heat into this closed loop of air, the air warms enough that the system can start to slowly open the loop and send some of the heat to the cabin. Once a sufficient cabin temperature has been reached, it can fully open the loop and provide heat directly to the cabin. While operating in this mode isn't any more efficient than using a PTC heater, it is typically only needed in extreme situations and most of the time we'll be able to use a different mode that is more efficient. One challenge of this approach is that it requires very accurate control of refrigerant flow to avoid the risk of the compressor ingesting liquid refrigerant and self-destructing. This is one of a few possible causes of the scattered reports of octavalve heating failures you may have heard about. I'll have another video at the end of this series diving into these heating failures. To demonstrate the last two lesser known advantages of the octavalve system, we're going to walk through an example scenario. Suppose you're getting ready to leave work on a cold winter morning. You've preheated the cabin from battery power, but the battery pack and drive unit are still cold. When you arrive at work, the cabin is still warm, the drive unit has gotten warm, and the battery pack has warmed a little due to internal resistance. A typical vehicle would now just sit idle and leftover heat in the cabin and drive unit would dissipate and be lost. Instead, we're going to use mode number eight and pull heat from the cabin and drive unit and use it to warm the battery. What we've just done is turn the battery pack into a heat battery. By my estimates, we can store up to three kilowatt hours worth of heat energy in the battery pack while still keeping the pack in its optimal temperature range. For some reference, that should be enough to fully warm the cabin on a winter day two to four times depending on the temperature. Through my research, I started to wonder at what stage of this system's development they realized they could utilize the battery pack as a thermal energy storage device. It could have very well been planned for from the beginning, but it also wouldn't surprise me if this were another case like sentry mode, where Tesla equipped the car with the hardware needed to do the job they had in mind and later realized there are other capabilities they could start to take advantage of with just software changes. Let's get back to the scenario. So when it comes time to leave work, and you start preheating the car, it can then pull that stored heat energy from the battery pack as well as some from the drive unit to heat the cabin. This approach is more efficient than trying to pull heat from outside as it is easier to pull heat from a higher temperature source than a lower temperature source. For the fourth and final factor to set this system apart, let's go back in this theoretical scenario to when we arrived at work and make one more assumption. Let's assume that this is a sunny winter day and the sun is adding a few hundred watts of additional heat to the cabin. Using this same mode we looked at earlier, we're able to harness and store that solar energy as heat to use later, all with no photovoltaics, no extra parts, just some brilliant engineering. To wrap things up, let's summarize all the distinct advantages of the Octavalve system over the competition. One, instead of having separate systems and redundant parts, we can manage all our components with a single system that can move heat between components. Two, we've eliminated all PTC heaters through clever use of existing components. Three, we've turned the battery pack into a thermal energy storage device. The long range pack currently in the three and Y would be capable of storing two to three kilowatt hours of heat energy in addition to the 82 kilowatt hours of electricity. Four, we're also technically capable of storing solar energy without needing photovoltaics or any extra parts. And five, the system is able to get smarter in how it operates through software. It could potentially predict future heating and cooling demand and adapt to how it operates in different conditions. Well, I hope this helped you understand a little about how Octavalve works and why it's so special. 
Hit the like button if you learned something and share this video with other Tesla fans or people that say Tesla has no competitive advantage. Don't forget to subscribe to catch the next videos in the series and we will take a deep dive into the hardware, look at all 15 modes of operation, and I'll describe some of the possible causes of the reported heating failures in winter. Have a great day and I'll see you in the next one.